All right, welcome to book club. We're gonna get started. Say the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this day. We're thankful for the many blessings, and we're thankful that we had a good weekend that helped us to relax and to take the needed time with our family. We're thankful for for the time that we had to dedicate to Thee. We pray that we can always do better. And that today we can focus on serving others and feeling thy spirit direct us. We're grateful for so many amazing tools um, to help us feel the spirit and to also help us serve and to and to do what is right. And we pray that we will utilize them. And we love thee so very much. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, we are gonna get started. And let's see, timer. Okay. All right. We're on page 17, which is chapter two or part two, I think is what they call it. The big secret of dealing with people. There's only one way under high heaven to get anybody to do anything. Did you ever stop to think about that? Yes, just one way. And that is by making the other person want to do it. Remember, there is no other way. Of course, you can make someone want to give you his watch by sticking a revolver in his ribs. You can make your employees give you cooperation until your back is turned by threatening to fire them. You can make a child do what you want it to do by a whip or a threat. But these crude methods have sharply undesirable repercussions. We're on the first page of chapter two, just then. Part two. The only way I can get you to do anything is by giving you what you want. What do you want? Sigmund Freud said that everything you and I do springs from two motives, the sex urge and the desire to be great. John Dewey, one of America's most profound philosophers, phrased it a bit differently. Dr. Dewey said that the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important. Remember that phrase, the desire to be important. It is significant, and you are going to hear a lot about it in this book. What do you want? Not many things, but the few things that you do wish you crave with an insistence that you will not be denied. Some of the things most people want include, number one, health and the preservation of life, number two, food, number three, sleep, number four, money and the things money will buy, number four, or sorry, five, <laughs> I know how to count, I swear, life in the hereafter, number six, sexual gratification, number seven, the well-being of our children, and number eight, a feeling of importance. Almost all these wants are usually gratified, all except one. But there is one longing, almost as deep, almost as imperious as the desire for food or sleep, which is seldom gratified. It is what Freud calls the desire to be great. It is what Dewey calls the desire to be important. <laughs> Lincoln once began a letter saying, everybody likes a compliment. William James said, the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. He didn't speak, mind you, of the wish or the desire or the longing to be appreciated. He said the craving to be appreciated. Here is a gnawing and unfaltering human hunger, and the rare individual who honestly satisfies this, hung this heart hunger will hold people in the palm of his or her hand, and even the undertaker will be sorry when he dies. The desire for a feeling of importance is one of the chief distinguishing differences between mankind and the animals. To illustrate, when I was a farm boy out in Missouri, oh look, Missouri, we got lots of Missourians in our team. <laughs> My father bred fine Duroc Jersey hogs and pedigreed white-faced cattle. We used to exhibit our hogs and white-faced cattle at the country fairs and livestock shows throughout the Middle West. We won first prizes by the score. My father pinned his blue ribbons on a sheet of white muslin, and when friends or visitors came to the house, he would get out the long sheet of muslin. He would hold one end and I would hold the other while he exhibited the blue ribbons. The hogs didn't care about the ribbons they had won, but father did. These prizes gave him a feeling of importance. If our ancestors hadn't had this flaming urge for a feeling of importance, civilization would have been impossible. Without it, we should have been just about like animals. It was this desire for a feeling of importance that led an uneducated, poverty-stricken grocery clerk to study some law books he found in the bottom of a barrel of household plunder that he had bought for 50 cents. You have probably heard of this grocery clerk. His name was Lincoln. 
It was a desire for a feeling of importance that inspired Dickens to write his immortal novels. This desire inspired Sir Christopher Wren to design his symphonies in stone. This desire made Rockefeller amass millions that he never spent. And this same desire made the richest family in your town build a house far too large for its requirements. This desire makes you want to wear the latest styles, drive the latest cars, and talk about your brilliant children. It is this desire that lures many boys and girls into joining gangs and engaging in criminal activities. The average young criminal, according to E.P. Mulrooney, one-time police commissioner of New York, is filled with ego and his first request after arrest is for those lurid newspapers that make him out a hero. The disagreeable prospect of serving time seems remote so long as he can gloat over his likeness sharing space with pictures of sports figures, movie, and TV stars and politicians. If you tell me how you get your feeling of importance, I'll tell you what you are. That determines your character. That is the most significant thing about you. For example, John D. Rockefeller got his feeling of importance by giving money to erect a modern hospital in Peking, China, to care for millions of poor people whom he had never seen and never would see. Dillinger, on the other hand, got his feeling of importance by being a bandit, a bank robber, and killer. When the FBI agents were hunting him, he dashed into a farmhouse up in Minnesota and said, I'm Dillinger. He was proud of the fact that he was public enemy number one. I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm Dillinger, he said. <laughs> yes, the one significant difference between Dillinger and Rockefeller is how they got their feeling of importance. History sparkles with amusing examples of famous people struggling for a feeling of importance. Even George Washington wanted to be called His Mightiness, the President of the United States. And Columbus pleaded for the title Admiral of the Ocean and Viceroy of India. Catherine the Great refused to open letters that were not addressed to Her Imperial Majesty. And Mrs. Lincoln in the White House turned upon Mrs. Grant like a tigress and shouted, How dare you be seated in my presence until I invite you. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Our millionaires helped finance Admiral Byrd's expedition to the Antarctic in 1928 with the understanding that ranges of icy mountains would be named after them, and Victor Hugo aspired to have nothing less than the city of Paris renamed in his honor. Even Shakespeare, mightiest of the mighty, tried to add luster to his name by procuring a coat of arms for his family. People sometimes become invalids in order to win sympathy and attention and get a feeling of importance. For example, take Mrs. McKinley. She got a feeling of importance by forcing her husband and the President of the United or sorry, her husband, the President of the United States, to neglect important affairs of state while he reclined on the bed beside her for hours at a time, his arm about her, soothing her to sleep. She fed her gnawing desire for attention by insisting that he remain with her while she was having her teeth fixed, and once created a stormy scene when he had to leave her alone with the dentist while he kept an appointment with John Hay, his Secretary of State. The writer, Mary Roberts Reinhardt, uh, once told me of a bright, vigorous young woman who became an invalid in order to get a feeling of importance. One day, said Mrs. Reinhardt, this woman had been obliged to face something, her age perhaps. The lonely years were stretching ahead and there was little left for her to anticipate. She took to her bed and for 10 years, her old mother traveled to the third floor and back carrying trays and nursing her. Then one day, the old mother, weary with service, laid down and died. For some weeks, the invalid languished. Then she got up, put on her clothing, and resumed living again. <laughs> Sad. Some authorities declare that people may actually go insane in order to find, in the dreamland of insanity, the feeling of importance that has been denied them in the harsh world of reality. There are more patients suffering from mental diseases in the United States than from all other diseases combined. Believe that. What is the cause of insanity? Nobody can answer such a sweeping question, but we know that certain diseases, such as syphilis, break down and destroy the brain cells and result in insanity. In fact, about one half of all mental diseases can be attributed to such physical causes as brain lesions, alcohol, toxins, and injuries. But the other half, and this is the appalling part of the story, the other half of the people who go insane apparently have nothing organically wrong with their brain cells. In post-mortem examinations, when their brain tissues were studied under the highest powered microscopes, these tissues are found to be apparently just as healthy as yours and mine. 
but what did their gut health look like? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Why do these people go insane? I put that question to the head physician of one of our most important psychiatric hospitals. The doctor who has received the highest honors and the most coveted awards for his knowledge of this subject told me frankly that he didn't know why people went insane. Nobody knows for sure. But he did say that many people who go insane find in insanity a feeling of importance that they were unable to achieve in the world of reality. Then he told me this story. I have a patient right now whose marriage proved to be a tragedy. She wanted love, sexual gratification, children, and social prestige, but life blasted all her hopes. Her husband didn't love her. He refused even to eat with her and forced her to serve his meals in his room upstairs. She had no children, no, no social standing. She went insane, and in her imagination, she divorced her husband and resumed her main name. She, been, she now believes she, she has married into English aristocracy, and she insists on being called Lady Smith. And that's all we have time for this morning. I feel like we're just getting, I feel like these chapters, this is kind of how it always is. It like tells the stories and then it like gets to the good stuff and then it's over. <laughs> right. And I was thinking last week, I was thinking that on Fridays should be our application day of what we read that week. I just feel like I need one morning to like slow down and think about it. Right. And I think that'd be good to just like talk for 10 minutes about what and how, like what it was that we read and how to apply it. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, cool. I do. Mm -hmm. I was kind of thinking, I'm going, okay, so now I have two books I'm juggling because I, I'm going back and doing some things from the 1% rule. Yeah. You know, I'm and I'm, yeah. So yes, that would be good. No, I'm thinking, I'm like, I really want to go back to that one too. And I'm like, I wonder if we should like take a small like I don't know how long break between the books to just like apply it to go back and say hey here's something I'm looking at yeah. or maybe ask the group what are some things y'all like to go back over and I think that'd be good we just have to decide how long because uh, yeah not too long Friday we could do it Friday <laughs> and then we could do like a week in between each book where we just apply it yeah that's a good idea so we'll do that after this book okay we can take a week somewhere to apply the other one <laughs> or we'll just have to do it on our own <laughs> yeah that one we may just have to just <laughs> on our own and move forward you know yeah gotta move forward gotta move forward all right thanks for tuning in <laughs>